and uh, he was telling me about his uh, bookkeeping software. So I thought he was an accountant in talk about Later, I'm going to talk more, and I found out that he's a very a Bitcoin developer, and he has um, worked with this uh, bookkeeping software, but also now he's working with Factum, which is a company that works on blockchain technology as well, and he will tell us a bit more about that too. Thank you. Uh, please welcome Brian. All right, uh, thank you all for coming. Um, <clears throat> so, I've been around this space for maybe a couple of years, and uh, I'm, I'm really excited about all this uh, decentralized technologies coming up. Uh, storage is uh, really, really interesting. Um, um, I want to talk about the, the next generation of stuff that uh, you should probably keep your eye on. Um, uh, uh, Rosal's already uh, made you guys uh, Bitcoin experts at this point from, uh, from his page, so uh, um, I'll take the, uh, the next step after that. Um, so I want to talk about uh, three things uh, today. Um, first is uh, pay to sidechains. This has been a project that's um, kind of been uh, mulling over for the past year, maybe. Um, and um, just this past week, the, uh, they put out their uh, white paper. So I want to tell you a little bit about that. Um, and then I want to kind of get into thinking about these decentralized systems uh, in, a, in a way that most people don't really talk about. Um, and so, both Bitcoin and um, Ethereum, and also Factum, uh, my project. Um, uh, different, different ways to think about those. So, um, uh, sidechain started with um, this guy, uh, Adam Beck. Um, he, there is only one name in the Bitcoin white paper by Satoshi, and, um, and that's this guy. Um, he, um, I got the pleasure of meeting him in uh, the uh, December conference in Las Vegas uh, last year. And uh, it was, um, I spent like a, an hour chatting with this, this guy. There's a whole bunch of people around. Um, and a, a passing artist uh, was so moved, he decided to, to pen the, uh, the thing. So that was a little memento. Um, but um, he was, uh, telling me about kind of a half-baked idea that he had that, um, that involved taking Bitcoin value um, and then moving it off the, uh, the blockchain. And then it could move around by different rules um, and then come back to... Um, uh, and then you uh, turn it back into Bitcoin value and then just send it around the Bitcoin network. Um, and at that time, he only had um, basically one uh, one-way pegging. So, if you guys are um, familiar with something called Counterparty, this was a uh, project. Um, uh, let's let's take a, a step back here. Um, how many uh, how many of you, uh, you guys are um, technical people here? Any um, developers, computer scientists? Okay. Um, and. How many people are, are really new to, uh, to Bitcoin here? Um, with, uh, okay. Um, so this is, this is kind of theoretical that I'm, I'm going to go into uh, at, at this point. So um, uh, value is um, subjective. It's, what some, it's all in our heads. Um, and um, if you um, wanted to have um, uh, value that um, uh, you could pass to someone else, um, and then it comes back. Um, so let's say you wanted to um, wanted to do something like uh, an old point, where uh, the um, the value moves around using different rules. Say. Um, <coughs> for a taxi service or um, something like that. Um, you can move the value off the, uh, the blockchain um, into this system. And 
and uh, in a way called a uh, two-way pick. Oh, back to uh, uh, counterparty, sorry. Um, counterparty implemented a one-way pick. So you take your Bitcoin value and you basically burn the value. Um, and then the value that you burned um, using counterparty um, appeared on the counterparty system. But there's no way to take those counterparty tokens and bring those back to Bitcoin and um, sell them to the window box for uh, anyone else who would accept Bitcoin. Um, and this sidechain innovation um, basically developed a two-way peg. So um, with sidechains, the value is locked up and stored um, in the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, and then it, uh, it appears on the sidechain. The value moves around on the other sidechain. When you're done with that, you destroy it on the other side chain, on the side chain, and then it reappears back on Bitcoin. Um, and doing this, you can do things that um, <clears throat> follow different rules. So uh, there's a 10 minute block, so block time. So on average, it takes about 10 minutes. So with the side chain, you can do one minute block time or um, varied other rules, say, um, you wanted uh, uh, an altcoin that, um, or uh, form of value, something like uh, Monero. Monero is a form of uh, tracking system. It's an altcoin that claims to be anonymous. Um, so with something like this, uh, you could turn your Bitcoin into that style of and then move it around on that and bring it back. Um, another thing that um, uh, sidechains will allow is something called atomic swaps. Um, so right now, um, atomic swap, an atomic swap is where um, me and another person decide to, chain, to trade something. Um, so let's say Dogecoin or Bitcoin. Uh, the problem right now is one person can send the value, and the other person can not fill, fulfill their side of the transaction. Um, atomic swap is where either both go through or none go through. And, uh, and right now in Bitcoin, there's a, um, with one little relaxing of the rule, you can make um, Bitcoin atomic swap possible. But the problem is, uh, to unwind it. So if the transaction doesn't go through, it will take an entire day. Um, so if the, the person who you're trading with, if the price changes a little bit, um, then um, they decide, oh, well, I don't want this deal anymore. And so they have to step back and your money's locked up for a day. Um, and with side chains, they're, uh, they have a, a feature in there to, to make it an instantaneous swap. So the, the money is atomic. It either moves or it doesn't. Um, and so um, with, um, with side chains, we're relying on the miners to, um, so there's something called a, um, <clears throat> a light client. Um, and so I'll get into this next, but um, so you're, um, your bitcoins will um, uh, appear on the side chain and the miners will go through and basically audit this for a while. And once they have enough votes that say, yes, uh, this money's moved and it's moved, and then it's um, a similar procedure to go back. Um, now there's a little bit of controversy with this because um, the miners, um, in Bitcoin, the miners cannot steal your money. Um, they can get control of the network for a, a small period of time. And if they do, they could censor you, which is bad, but um, is uh, not the end of the world. Um, but the problem with, uh, with side chains is if they get control of the network for a period of time, they can steal the money. Um, and so there's another, um, uh, feature in here where 
if anyone sees that the money is trying to be stolen, they can let the rest of the network know, and it will um, put a hold on that on that theft. Um, and all this is is theoretical at this point. The software hasn't been developed, and it's not inside of Bitcoin yet. Um, so. <clears throat> This is going to be coming over the next few years where we basically just developed the, um, uh, the idea. Um, so let's, let's think about what the miners do. So um, sure, they, they expend lots and lots of electricity. Mm -hmm. But um, the, uh, they do two main things. First, what they do is they resolve what's called a double spin. So if I take money. And I send it to, to one person and to another person at the same time. The miners decide which one of those is a valid and which one's invalid. Um, and what they do is they spend lots of electricity so that they cannot change their mind later without burning millions of dollars worth of electricity. Um, so that's kind of a, a fair compromise. Um, and also, they, they bought it. Um, so the Bitcoin miners, <clears throat> they both finalize the transactions, and they make sure that um, they basically offer up to any uh, light clients um, an attestation that they say, all these transactions follow the rules, and I'm, I'm betting my Bitcoins that, uh, that I said that these rules have been followed. Um, so um, Ethereum is um, similar to, uh, to Bitcoin. Ethereum, I see Ethereum as what Bitcoin wanted to be uh, when Bitcoin was young. Um, so Satoshi put in limitations to um, the, the scripting language in Bitcoin. Um, so Bitcoin is more about just moving money. It's uh, when I spend money, I basically um, say someone who can execute this computer program uh, can take the money. And most of the time, it's that computer program is someone who has a private key. But it can be a bit more expressive than that. Um, so the computer program can say uh, these two people or two or three people, uh, two or three keys, um, or um, with some more unlocked features, if someone knows a secret number, um, that uh, then they can unlock money. But um, Satoshi knew that this would be um, attacked. Uh, so if he made a language that um, was very expressive. People could do some nasty things to the network. Um, and so he basically made the, the network, uh, the language very uh, limited. Um, and so Ethereum made it so it's mm, a lot less limited. Um, so if, uh, if you pay enough fees uh, in the Ethereum system, you can um, run very long, complex programs. Um, and they also um, are using CPU mining, which is another trade-off that they made. So in, in mining, um, you get to decide who you want to be your, uh, your auditor when the, when the system was set up. So for Bitcoin, um, at this point, it's very large capital investment projects which are the people who are making policy, finalizing transactions, doing the auditing, um, and <clears throat> which is, is a trade-off. So they're centralized because they need to buy lots of power and they're gaining from economies of scale. Um, but if you don't spend tons of money, then you can't join the system. Um, and Ethereum has uh, chosen to go with the CPU mining uh, system, where the common person on their desktop computer can go through and mine for, um, and 
participate. Um, but it's a double-edged sword because of botnets. So um, if hackers take over 100,000 computers, now they have 100,000 votes in the Ethereum network, um, which is, is a trade-off. Uh, they may be making the right decisions, um, but they may not. Um, it's, um, it's, it's hard to say whether anonymous people or people who spend capital investments uh, would be making better decisions. Um, and also, <clears throat> the Ethereum system will audit the, uh, the, the state. So when they run this script, um, they'll basically put their money on the line that says, I audited this and I say it's okay. Um, So, um, Factum is, is a little bit different of a system. Um, we're going to take, we're trying to uh, take advantage of the, um, the Bitcoin network itself. Um, there is tons of computational power and it's going to cost millions of dollars to reverse transactions. Um, but for uh, a lot of things, the audits are not so simple. So with Bitcoin, an audit is simple. If the signature checks out OK, then it's valid. Um, and that's easy to be checked by a computer, and that's a script that can run. Well, the world is a messy place. And a lot of times, auditors need um, a lot more uh, judgment than did the script execute? Um, and so, um, with Factum, we're not trying to do any of this. Um, so what we're take, what we're going to do is we're going to collect a whole bunch of transactions, um, and we're going to uh, take whatever anyone is going to attest to. But we're not going to do any auditing on that. Um, and so. <clears throat> the, the system is basically going to rely on specialized auditors. Um, and so if you do have a system set up, so it's very easy to go through and if it's just a computer script that needs to run to, to validate it, um, then the, the system should be able to, a computer can validate it pretty easily. Um, but if it's, um, Um, something more complex, then um, you need to rely on some human auditor who has developed a reputation that uh, they're going through and double checking um, things, things that happen. And I'll have an example of some minutes here. So um, all of this can be done, uh, like um, Raza was saying, directly on the blockchain, where you take your data and you embed it directly into the blockchain. Um, but the problem is it's slow. Um, it will take 10 minutes, and for something that's okay, and some things it's not. Um, cost, the uh, Bitcoin blockchain is a limited resource. Um, only so much data can fit in a block, and even if that size goes up, um, it's not going to be able to store the world's data. Um, maybe the storage guys can pick that up. Um, and, uh, it's, it's a scarce resource, so people are going to compete for space and based on price on that. Um, and uh, this blockchain getting big, they call it uh, bloat, um, which is you know, what we're trying to avoid. Um, and we're trying to make basically like a generalized system of record. So take pieces of paper and we'll pack them together and make them so that you can't undo the, uh, the recording of the data, because to do that, you would need to spend millions of dollars worth of electricity. Um, and um, so to give you a good example, land titles. So say you wanted to, um, to 
record uh, a property moving from one person to another. Um, you need to have uh, a centralized location to, to find the records. So uh, in the US, for example, like a, a county um, uh, recorder's office, they'll have all of the land records for that county. And if the uh, transfer isn't in there, then it may as well not have existed. Um, and so with our factum system, there's a narrow scope within the um, where it can be found. Um, and if it's not within that narrow scope, then it may not have well uh, existed. And also, retroactive changes can be, can be uh, should be obvious. So let's say that the um, uh, the brother of the county official goes in and tears out a page from the, the county book and undoes your sale. Um, with our system, uh, unless he also had millions of dollars worth of electricity, he couldn't do it. Um, so the, the change would be obvious. And um, I'm pretty much out of time, so um, I'll go ahead and uh, take some questions. Uh, Does anybody have questions? Brian? Is Factum then like an old coin with a separate blockchain and everything, or? Um, it will have its own token. Um, the token is primarily to ensure consensus. Um, so, with um, in the Bitcoin system, the the miners basically compete with each other, um, and if one of them diverges and does their own thing, then um, that person's Bitcoins will not be useful. They can't sell them because they're not part of the main network. And uh, we're trying to do the same thing with Factum. So if one of the Factum servers decides to, to break off, which uh, will be difficult, but um, if they if there's a fork in the system, then um, now you've got this another system which is not the Factum system, um, and the, the tokens would be that the generator will be uh, worthless. So there, there will be a, a token system, yes. We have another question too. Um, what sort of data are you planning to store on Factum? Is it, because you're, you're wanting to do this more complex auditing. Do you have, uh, is it like land titles? Or are you, like what's the scope that you're envisioning? It's pretty arbitrary, the, uh, the, the data. So. Um, we're trying to just build a, a platform to store data that can't be undone. Um, so, for example, with Bitcoin, you can do that, but it's, it's kind of a hack. Um, and uh, another thing that uh, we, uh, we talk about is um, like video camera footage, so, uh, or photographs. So, um, if you take a picture and then it hashes it and timestamps it, you can prove later on that that picture existed and was not photoshopped. And you can show 30 years later that between when it was taken and 30 years from now, no photoshopping has happened. How are you handling uh, resource constraints then? Are, are you using a very different system than sort of the Bitcoin blockchain? Or are you like, because I, I, it, it seems very difficult to have your photograph on everybody's in like a public ledger, okay. right? Um, so we're not going to store the photograph. So the, the, the data that we're planning on storing is, A, it's going to be on a, um, a BitTorrent-like network. So uh, people are going to, to join the network and to um, offer their um, some storage and potentially take care of it. And then um, they get compensated for it when they return data. Um, um, and it, it will be, it, um, it will cost money to put um, data into the system. So you're not going to store large pieces of data in the system unless you pay an exorbitant fee. Um, but storing just the, the hash, the, the fact that you took the picture.
Any other questions from Brian? Well, let's thank him again. Our next talk is in five minutes.